I'd like to welcome you all to this segment of Winning Chess the Easy Way. On this tape, you'll see a lot of fun things and some instructional games. You'll see us in Las Vegas. I'll be here with my sisters, Judith and Sophia. We are playing a unique event, our first ever triplex simo, playing against 81 players at once. And you'll see segments from that. You'll see us in the Breakfast with the Polar Sisters, where there are question and answers from all the different fans, and an interview with Paul Truong about how to improve your game. Also, you'll see three of my favorite instructional games that are very interesting and I enjoy playing them and I enjoy showing them over and over. I think they are very clear how to develop a plan and uh, how to attack. Sit back, enjoy, have a good time. In the first uh, part, you'll see how much time you'll have, but in the first time, I'll show you one of my favorite games that uh, I played back in 1990 in Germany against uh, Grandmaster Bunch, and uh, I'll try to show you a logical thinking, how I build up a plan from early in the game and the middle game and how to develop an attack. I had the white pieces and played d4, and he played knight f6. I played c4, and he played e6, knight c3, and d5. So far, both of us are making very natural moves, and now after the first couple of moves, the game has transposed to a queen's gambit declined game, which usually is a very conservative place for black. This position I made the so-called exchange variation by trading the pawns and therewith <coughs> determining the pawn structure. Pawn captured back on d5, and this is the so-called Carlsbad pawn structure. I'll talk a little bit more about the plans that come along with this pawn formation. I played bishop g5 for now, developing the bishop and creating a pin. There is a very famous opening trap here that uh, black can try to pull on white by playing knight b to d7, which my opponent did not play in this game. And here it seems that white can win a pawn by capturing the d5 pawn using the pin but this is very deceiving, it's not a case, because if white would play that move, black could capture the knight. And now, after the bishop captures black's queen, the black bishop gets out to b4, checking white's king, the only move is to block the check, and now black could take the white bishop on d8, or taking the queen first, and then the bishop, and black won a piece. So that would be a big mistake on white's side. Of course, white just con should continue developing as normal after knight d7, but this is a very famous and important opening trap. My opponent played c6 to protect the d5 pawn for the future. And I responded with e3, letting my light squared bishop out. And my opponent played bishop to e7 to neutralize the existing pin over the knight. And here I played queen to c2. Queen to c2, the main idea is to prevent the black bishop of getting out to this diagonal to f5, and also in some cases, white even considers castling to the queen's side. Not in this game, but in some other games, white does that successfully. Here my opponent made a strange move. 
not a move I would choose, let's say, as black, or not a move that black usually chooses in this position. Usually black would play castling, or black would play knight b8 to d7, developing. Bishop g7 is an interesting idea, but I don't think it's such a great idea. Black's plan is to try to trade those bishops, let's say after bishop d3, to come to h5 and then come to g6. That's Black's strategical plan. Because if these bishops will be traded off the board, Black managed to trade off his bad bishop, relatively bad. Why is it relatively bad? Because of the pawn structure, as you see, these pawns are all on light squares, while these are all on dark squares. So now only the pair of bishops that are running on the dark squares are on the board, and potentially, the black bishop can attack this chain of pawns, and more, most importantly, that these are blocked, so they cannot just move to the side easily, while white bishop cannot attack black pawns. So it's a small strategical gain to trade a pair of bishops of, uh, of uh, in this case, because as I said, the pawns are on the color of the bishop, so that's why now this is considered a relatively bad bishop compared to the black bishop. So this is the strategical idea behind Black's plan here. I understood that, and that is why I instead played my knight to e2. So I rather want to change my knight, of course, for the bishop, but not the bishop. So now if the black bishop tries to do the same deal to go to g6, I'm ready to play knight to f4, right? And if the bishop goes to g6, I want to trade my knight for the bishop. So that's my plan. And if black doesn't do either of that, then my plan is to play knight to g3. Then the bishop is kind of awkward on g4 because it cannot go back to h5 and it kind of doesn't do anything on g4. I just got my bishop out as planned. So my opponent here played a, to me, surprising move, I, something I, I didn't expect or honestly didn't quite understand either why he took, giving up his pair of bishops for a knight. I took back <coughs> my bishop. And now the knight developed to d7, and both sides cancelled. Okay, and at this moment, I'd like to discuss the plans in this type of position. What can be the plans? Normally, we discuss by pawn structure, white has two main plans to choose from. One is the so-called minority attack. What does it mean? Minority means the smaller, the less quantity of pawns versus the more quantity of pawns on the queen's side. And this specific pawn formation that can happen from many openings, not just from Queen's Gambit, but very common from the Karo Khan, for example, or some other openings. Here, one common plan is to start an attack, which is very unusual because normally we tend to attack, and normally it's good to attack when we are stronger. And that is why this is an exception where we are attacking very weaker. However, it's a very commonly accepted and a good idea to do that. And White usually does it with moves like, for example, Rook B1, preparing a pawn advance of B4 and B5. And what would be the purpose of this pawn push up? The purpose is to ruin Black's pawn structure, to weaken Black's pawn structure. Because Black would have three choices after this push up of the pawn. Either to trade, in that case, Black gets an isolated pawn on d5, that's a target for White to attack. Or Black pushes the pawn through, in that case, we can trade the d-pawn for the c-pawn, and again, black gets stuck with the isolated pawn on d5. That's a target. Or c, that black, leaves the pawn as it is, allows white the trade on c6, takes back with the pawn, and then 
Black got an isolated pawn on a7, but more importantly, got a weakness, a backward pawn on c6 that can be attacked by the white rook coming to the c1, to the c5, and the queen from the side, and white can try to enter into black's position via the b file, rook b7, or such moves later. So this is the general idea from white's perspective, one of them, the minority attack. Now, another plan in this type of position is to try to prepare a breakthrough in the center, and that is with playing f3 and e4 type of plans, as some of you may remember, in the Nimza Indian, they do sometimes those type of plans. This is what we'll see in this game, actually. Now, what is black's play? Black's play, usually in this opening, uh, revolves around trying to get counterplay on the king's side in case white is trying the minority attack. A, trying to block as much as possible white's advance on the queen's side, and B, trying to get counterplay on this side, since white is concentrating in that case, in that plan, most of his pieces on the queen's side. It just is a very logical game. If your opponent is attacking you with all his pieces on one side, if you're talking about counterattack, logically, he had to leave few pieces only on the other side. So he must be weak on that side. So therefore, it's a logical thing to attack that side. You don't usually attack a side where the opponent is strong. You attack the weakness of the opponent. And that's very logical. Also, many times, black tries to play the knight jump to e4. In this specific case, it looks a little difficult because uh, black doesn't have enough support on that square, but that's also one of the plans to activate himself through that move. Okay, so my next move was bishop to d3, and that is to gain more control of the e4 square, preparing to play f3, followed by e4, and advancing in the center. Especially in positions when one side has a pair of bishops, and the other one does not, as a bishop and a knight, let's say, as in return. It's very much to the advantage of the side who has the bishops, both bishops, to open up the position. And that was the reason why I chose this plan in this case, because I already got that advantage. Normally, in this pawn structure, usually, this bishop for the knight does not get traded so quickly or ever. And uh, that's why it's not so common to play this f3, e4 pawn advance plan. And it doesn't work as well and it, as it did in this game. Let's see how the game proceeded. My opponent played rook e8, which is a very logical and common move in such positions. The rook occupies the half open file. Half open we mean when only the opponent has a pawn on that side and you don't. So therefore, from black's perspective, since there is no pawn on the e file, it is a half open file. Also, it clears the f8 square for black pieces. Usually the black knight tends to go to f8 and then regroups to e6 or g6. So it's a very understandable common move. And I followed up, as I said, playing f3, ready to play e4, and advancing in the center. My opponent played here knight to f8. Now I have to be a little bit careful because I cannot play e4 right away because my d4 pawn could get in trouble. After pawn trade, all of a sudden there would be a discovered attack on my d4 pawn, so I would lose a pawn. I cannot do that. I need to do some preparation. And I played bishop to h4. You will see very soon why. And my opponent played a6. Perhaps having in mind to play c5 and guarding the b5 square for that purpose, to prevent bishop b5 or such move of mine. I played rook a to d1. Again, getting ready, optimizing the position before I'm opening it. That's very important, especially in situations when you'd have the time to do it in certain situations. Every move is very important, and you need to calculate everything and be very forceful. Here, it's a time when I have the time to optimize all my pieces 
for the opening of the position.